Now, before completing his takeover of Twitter in October, Elon Musk described himself as a free speech absolutist. Today, he's facing accusations of hypocrisy after journalists who'd been reporting on him had their accounts suspended, as did one of Twitter's main rivals. He began by banning Elon Jet, an account which posted the flight path of his private plane. A month earlier, Elon Musk had tweeted, My commitment to free speech extends even to not banning the account following my plane. But last night, Twitter's boss reversed that, saying, Criticising me all day long is totally fine, but doxing, a word used to describe the posting of personal information, my real-time location, and endangering my family is not. Along with the jet tracker, a number of reporters, including those from the New York Times and CNN, had their accounts suspended. Musk tweeting that the same rules for doxing applied to journalists, although the journalists say they were simply reporting on his actions. He later appeared on a Twitter audio discussion, justifying the suspensions. There is not going to be any distinction in the future between journalists, civil journalists, and, and regular people. Everyone's going to be treated the same. You dox, you get suspended. End of story trying to be clever about it, like, oh, I posted a link to the real-time information. That is obviously simply trying to evade the, the, the meaning. There's no different from them actually showing real-time information. But this wasn't good enough for the European Commission. Today, it issued a statement saying EU law protects media freedom and Elon Musk should know there are red lines and sanctions soon. What those sanctions amount to and what Elon Musk makes of them is not yet clear. But his unilateral actions once again focus attention on what critics see as his undue influence on social media and free speech. For now, ever the publicist, Musk has posted a poll asking whether the journalists should be reinstated now or see out their seven-day ban. Well, I've been speaking to Aaron Rupa, one of the journalists suspended from Twitter, and I asked him why he thought he'd been accused of intending to harm Elon Musk. Uh, I've never wanted to assassinate Elon Musk, um, nor did I even uh, mean to track his movements, um, anything of that sort. I um, linked to a Facebook page which tracks his private jet and noted that it still existed, even though the Twitter account had been banned. And when I posted that tweet, never in my wildest dreams that I think I would um, get in trouble for it or be banished for it. But, you know, I think we're seeing that it's Elon Musk's playground. And if he wants to kick people out of it, that's his prerogative. Yeah. I mean, and, and he's now got a poll up as to whether you should get your account back in seven days or straight away. I think the poll's going in your favour at the moment. Um, but it has a chilling effect, doesn't it, uh, in terms of what people are going to say about Elon Musk and all his businesses now. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think that's part of the goal. And, you know, it's very likely part of his goal to create that chilling effect where, you know, beyond linking to this Facebook page, the one commonality that myself and the other journalists who were banned yesterday have is that we've all been critical of Elon Musk and the way that he is running Twitter. And so now, you know, as I'm pondering possibly getting back on Twitter, um, I'd be lying to you if I didn't say that that will be kind of in the back of my mind um, that, hey, if you post this thing critical of Elon Musk, you might be banned. Well, th there are right wing commentators and Elon Musk fans saying, well, where were you when they banned Donald Trump? You know, um, is, is freedom of speech only applicable to liberals? Yeah, well, I think the important thing to keep in mind is that Violations of freedom of speech here in the U.S. just have to do with government interference in speech. Um, it really has nothing to do with the operations of private businesses. So I would never portray myself as being a victim of any sort of free speech infringement. I mean, I will point out the hypocrisy of Elon Musk saying just weeks ago that his commitment to freedom of speech, as he understands it, extends to this Elon Jet account. And, you know, clearly he has changed his mind because his actions directly contradict what he said on Twitter publicly just a few weeks ago. But, um, you know, I think obviously the difference with Donald Trump was that he was determined to violate the terms of service because he had used the platform to incite an insurrection here in the U.S. and to try and overthrow an election. But he clearly fears for his safety and the safety of his family. And, and you did link to an account that got round his attempts to have privacy for the location of his jet. Um, and... and did reveal where it was. 
I don't think so because, you know, it's just the a fact of life that reporting on the whereabouts of private jets is something that has been just a part of media reporting here for many, many years. I mean, you know, there was recently, you know, Taylor Swift was in the news because she was flying various places in her private jet. I mean, we I can think of many examples of college football coaches who take job interviews and people report on where their jets are located. I mean, this is all publicly available information. People are looking to other networks. Um... But the fact is that when it comes to news and politics, Twitter is it. Yeah, I mean, you make a really good point. I mean, the thing that is so important about Twitter is just the scale of it. The fact that, you know, pretty much any actively working journalist is on there, public officials are on there, brands are on there, sports teams are on there. And so there isn't really an alternative that has that sort of scale. But a lot of people have built their whole careers around Twitter and their profile is, is dependent on it. Is this too big? to be allowed to be at the whim of one person? Well, um, it's not too big if you're the richest man in the world and can afford to pay, you know, tens of billions of dollars over what the sticker price was for it. Um, you know, it is unfortunate in some ways that we got to this point and it would have been nice had Twitter been more of a public utility with transparency and accountability to people other than those who are trying to make a profit from it or, you know, in Elon's case, trying to uh, pursue some sort of political vendetta on the program or on the platform, I should say. But, um, you know, I guess my attitude toward it, towards it at this point is that it basically is what it is. I don't think there's any sort of policy solution to it. I think it's more a question, you know, if you're the White House and you're running Joe Biden's account and you're running accounts for all these different officials in the White House, at what point do you cut bait and say, you know, we really don't want to be associated with this? I mean, sure, there may be a lot of people on the platform to whom we want to disseminate messages and communicate, um, get our messages out there. But at what point are you kind of propping up someone who is using this platform for nefarious ends? And I think, you know, brands will have to grapple with that. Media outlets will have to grapple with that. And so I think it's going to be more of a private sector solution than any sort of policy intervention at this point. Aaron Rupa, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.